Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these videos, this work, you can join the YouTube channel directly at even $5 or $1 a month, or you could head over to patreon.com slash aksum. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash a-k-s-u-m. Our special guest, returning guest, Arka Merhagabru, friend of the show, Diakon Alamasilasi. Welcome back to the program. Thank you, Henok. And um, just to remind people, because we've I think we've had a couple of conversations in, in English and in Amharic. Today we'll we'll do it in, in English again. Um, can you tell people just briefly how you got interested in in the subject of mas'af or the subject of the writings of the church or the scripture of the church um and in in the context of which you know you you began earlier on in your career in the diaconate let's say or vocation in the diaconate on the singing side um i i think my interest in uh uh came later uh it you know, because it's a difficult, the uh, Andamta commentary, the published texts are uh, pretty difficult to um, uh, to get into. The Amharic is classical, it's medieval. Uh, the quotations are uh, ge'ez, you know, so, and, and it assumes a knowledge of a lot of Christian literature, at least a lot of Ethiopian uh, Christian literature so it came later uh, and um, when I first started looking at it I didn't even really understand what what was going on in the commentary texts and so um, I would say I was college aged when I when I started looking at these things uh, and I think the uh, uh, research uh, and um, study kind of th those influences from undergrad definitely gave me the um, energy to uh, study or engage in the text to, and, and look at them to the ability that I was able to then, even if it wasn't much. That's right. You told us one of the times you've been on the pod before, just for anyone who happens to be a new listener that you had spent a year in high school and a year after graduating undergrad in Ethiopia at, at two different monasteries, one Zawai south of Addis Ababa um, and one <clears throat> Taika Nagast Ba'atala Mariam in Addis Ababa itself. When you were there, um, I, I know you studied some some reading as well. Did you ever like walk by or hear them doing the kind of the mas'af bit or the tirigwami bit? Like, I'm well, well, when that. I was when I was at Baata, actually, um, uh, 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 I I was in the um, participating in the Akwakwam school. That was where I was. Uh, that was what I was learning, and I had uh, uh, established a friendship with many students. And uh, even the dean of the school uh, was a very good friend, is a very good friend of mine, Dika Gubay uh, Gitahun uh, Demsa, who is uh, who was a, a, a teacher of the uh, Andimta of the New Testament corpus. And uh, I often we often ate together um, midday and at his um, father's house or his uncle's house. Uh, who raised him, uh, who's the New Testament commentary teacher at Bata and has been for a very long time, Yunita Demsa. So I was around it uh, and I did have access uh, to any, you know, inquiries, um, whether it was through casual conversation with him or so on. And um, that afforded me access to uh, uh, a lot of information and texts and so uh, I, I was definitely, yeah, I was there. Uh, it was around, um, I, it was all in the environment. It was in the, um, it was in the uh, educational setting, in the classes, it was in the social setting. Um, and so I definitely encountered it at, at Ba'ata. 
and not and not right. and, and not before i did not encounter it at zoi there was no mess off when i was uh, at zoi you know that that field of study was not present but baata uh which um has um seats or uh guwaiat for uh most if not all of the branches of uh ecclesial education yeah um uh, that's interesting that's an interesting point both being monasteries but not every monastery teaches everything but kind of the i think the vision of emperor minlik and queen consort aidu and emperor zoditu and all that was to have a facility in addis ababa that had everything so that you didn't have to travel so far to the countryside just to learn well i'm sure there's some righteousness gained and always funny stories of dog bites and having to beg for food there's uh, there's an advantage to using the technology and modern science in a way to glorify god by by having it approximate to where more, more people are were moving to and and living so that 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 does make sense that they would have more i don't think about that often cuz you almost assume with places like baata and debredubanos they usually have most things so it's it's uh you think less often of of the places that may not have everything that may be more more narrow specialist places than than generalist places and 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 baata is um it, it's also actually a place of advanced study um to the extent that you can think of that of of the traditional avenant schools as being a place of advanced study because the uh students that came that would come to baata they would they would come uh uh f- f- through merit uh and um based on previous accomplishments so they are not new students uh, and when they come there they're they're coming there to um uh masmaskar or to to establish themselves to revise their field or whatever they're uh, learning and to establish themselves as teachers and uh even um in 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 the 70s um there were you know scholars like uh Nick Adikaunt Mahari Tirfe who um is whose whose text is what is published under the Pauline Andamta commentaries so wow. Turgwami Paulos uh the Andamta publication the text is the work of Dikari Kaunt Mahari Tirfe who was the um uh, ad- administrator of Baata uh and then i think he was the bishop of gondar later on also wow. and if you find older editions of the pauline commentary in the introduction you you'll see dik adik aunt mahari turfe's introduction to uh the commentary corpus uh, of of the pauline um uh, of the pauline epistles and so bata it, it, you know i i think for all intents and purposes you can call it also a place of advanced study it's uh n- not necessarily uh, for be- uh, beginners although it does serve to that capacity um it teaches people at any level but those who uh achieve um um uh, scholarships there are students that come there uh, through merit and who are uh they they, they have to compete but would it didn't know botami is with I've I've heard that same thing and I've heard about sometimes you know bishops will award you a scholarship um but sometimes people will take a chance and just learn on their own it is interesting how some some of the places you can just pay to enroll but some of the places you have to you have to compete to get in it, you know the last guest we had on the philosophy art and science was actually uh, Dr. Mike Wingert who is another dean uh in your orbit so you know uh you know a few deans of certain schools it's good to have these people in your orbit at the agora university so we talked on that episode about agora so i don't have to rehash everything about that but i know you've completed your studies there and we're in the final stages before we eventually get your book which we can't wait for um but in the meantime you have an article for us on the andimta corpus and how it is text critical could you tell us the the article uh the full proper name and and the journal that it's slated to be in 
uh, it, it's slated to be in the uh, Alexandrian Journal, which is a um, academic uh, uh, journal, and um, the title is uh, the Andimta as a text critical tradition. And um, what it what it is about it is it is about the epistemology of the Andimta commentary tradition. Uh, and I want to clarify what what I mean by that because that's a mouthful. Um, uh, epistemology it's the textual the article is about the textual epistemology of the Andamta tradition now epistemology is uh, comes from the Greek epistema which is which is knowledge and epistemology is the study of knowledge and what that means is it's particularly concerned with the validity and scope of knowledge and so um, when we when I'm talking about the title as the textual epistemology, it's the question of the validity and scope of the text of scripture itself from the uh, from the perspective of the Andamta tradition. And the Andamta tradition, uh, I should explain that too, Andamta is the uh, name for a form of biblical commentary tradition that emerged in the 15th, around the 15th century, although its crystallization continued for a few hundred years, um, but it's an um, Amharic commentary tradition on Ge'ez texts that emerged in the 15th century from a previous commentary tradition. And so the Andamta tradition is a very Ethiopian biblical commentary tradition, and the one that came before it is also, um, but it preserves, uh, it preserves a very particular worldview, and um, it's, you know, it's packed with this perspective from the 15th, 16th, 1700s. And so going back to the title of the article, it is the uh, validity of knowledge or the, the scope and validity of the text of scripture as um, understood by the Ethiopian scholars of the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, that, that uh, period. So the Andimta is like, you, I think we talked about it a little last time, but just to refresh people's minds, it's the Ge'ez to Amharic, similar to the the Targum. And the older tradition you're talking about is the Ge'ez to Ge'ez. Do they just call that one Tirguami or Tirguami. That the, the older tradition is just known as Tirguami, mm -hmm. and it's a Ge'ez commentary on uh, Ge'ez text. And the commentary is sometimes indigenous, it's Ethiopian sometimes, and then sometimes it's uh, gathered from the Christian Orient from reading various texts. Sometimes the Turguami is itself a full-blown translation from Arabic um, or Syriac. Um, and and so, do we know how old that is? I mean, we, we always talk about how old the Ethiopian church is. I mean, in your best educated guess or if you don't want to venture a best educated guess the evidence like how far back does the evidence point to us do we do we have any uh as good as commentary from the zagwe period from before the 1200s do we have any from the Aksumite period no not that i know not that i know of not that i know of. we do from at least the 1300s 1400s we we have we have manuscripts, we have Giz Vegas manuscripts that are older than that too. Uh, but you know they may be copies of an older tradition or whatever. But it's hard to say anything before the 1500s because of Ahmed Grain, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, Andimta arose as a um, recovery from the destruction that uh, that Ahmed Grain had incurred, and it seems that the Gondarin. Um, emperors requested that the that the biblical scholars create a commentary tradition in amharic so that people could understand you see what i'm saying so mm -hmm. it it uh andamtas in in, in it, to some extent arose out of a reaction uh to uh, recover um the and literary... it was a king it was a king or just the different scholars or well the kings um the kings uh, gathered the scholars. They mm -hmm. summoned them, and they 
gave them material support and you know they wanted them to come together and revise their knowledge and um, establish it uh, as a uh, unified tradition um, and so they would gather them in in different localities within the city of Gondar. Uh, and if you go to Gondar now, you know, you can go to Baata, you can go to uh, uh, various uh, church parishes in, in, the, in the capital of Gondar, and you will still find these established uh, communities uh, of, of scholars that come there to, um, con you know, convene on uh, or uh, learn or um, refine, or um, uh, establish themselves as as teachers. Uh, it's where it's where the scholars go to um, uh, establish, you know, themselves as teachers and so on. Yeah, it's very impressive. And for those who are watching, who maybe know Ethiopian history a little less, the the wound of you know fascist Italy is still playing out in some of the politics today i mean the wounds of communism the the wounds of fascist italy before that the first italian invasion but it would surprise i think some of the audience to know the wounds from the 1500s invasion of ahmed Gurang, who is either uh, a man of the adal sultanate being somali or of harar in any case um, uh, which would make him a former aksumite potentially uh, allied with the Yemeni and with the Ottomans for 11 years, almost destroyed all of Ethiopia. There's a, a book written about that campaign, and it's only the part one. They never got to the part two because they didn't finish. But basically all that remained of Ethiopia was what was recently called Gwajam and Gwander and Tigray. And everything else, Wello, Shoah, all of the south, was conquered uh, by him and that kind of um that that type of territorial expansion that he was able to do for so long allowed for other forces from the south to come in and and some from the west as well to totally change the landscape of ethiopia and so what deacon alamas is telling us is that after with the help of the Portuguese and get, getting time to gather ourselves, these people felt kind of an existential crisis. I don't know if it's true, but, you know, for example, our, our canon books say deacons are supposed to be ordained at 25. Most are ordained as little boys. And I, I hear the priests nowadays always say that the reason for that is because they ran out of people. And so they had to start getting people young. I always thought it was because uh, it's easier to teach them how to sing at a younger age, but what I hear many no, fathers say no. is, is because it's a reaction, like you said, an an absence of uh, a, a bishop to ordain, and so you know when the bishop is there, any candidate is um, gathered and you know ordained because you don't know when it is the next time you're going to see a bishop. You know you may never see one again, and so on. It's incredible that the church lasted and survived at all. With that sort of like, you don't know whether you're going to see a bishop again. That's pretty crazy. That's like, yeah, a, it's a pretty crazy circumstance. And and this and, and and the Andamtar emerged out of that, out of, out of that. And and you have to uh, understand that the material destruction was almost total. Churches were completely burned. Um, uh, texts, manuscripts were decimated. Um, people were uh, slaughtered, uh, and the um churches were looted because they were they were um holders of like valuable uh, uh things whether it be uh, gold uh books uh, and so on uh, they, they may have crowns of 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 princes uh and so on and so the destruction was almost complete and it, it's out of this period that the uh, that this tradition developed. And so uh, going back to the, the article, uh, it, is a, um, it is about the doctrine of knowledge, uh, the doctrine of scriptural knowledge that we 
are able to gain from the biblical commentary, the Ethiopian biblical commentary tradition, and it is kind of at odds with what you would expect. So it's it's it is. Uh, talk talk the, about that. Yeah, talk about the expectations because even like the the phrasing text. I I wonder the text critical. I know we understand what it is now in kind of modern biblical scholarship, but I wonder you know what sort of words they would use. Um, our mutual friend Deacon Mahadi and I always joke about that in terms of in the university setting, the terms that they use to describe is grammar versus the traditional school's terms for is grammar. They they use different terms. They're not using the same terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, even when you look at when you look at um, uh, epistemology, that's a Greek mm -hmm. word. Yeah, they would not have used that word. They would have no, they would have not known <laughs> that word. Uh, yeah. So. You know, you you ask the question, how did they engage mm -hmm. in the question of uh, knowledge itself? Yeah, and um, I think a good example is Kadasi Dioscoros, Kadasi Epiphanios, the fraction prayer, uh, and, and these liturgies, these ana anaphoras, are dated to the 15th century. So this is this is about the same time as Andimta as the Andimta's development. And as a side note, I know, um, you know, the reaction among uh, some people when you tell them the anaphoras were written by Ethiopians uh, and in the 15th century is kind of adverse. Um, but this is, it, it's surely the case. Uh, and, you know, it's based off of the work of initially Dr. Gita Cho Haile, um, and after him, Dr. Mabratu Kiros and so on. And, um, uh, uh, you know, if we look at how our uh, ancestors engaged in epistemological questions, it's interesting because it's different from the Greek fathers, like uh, the um, fourth century uh, Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, Basil the Great, you know, they ask the philosophical questions the theological questions using the full rigor of classical philosophy. And uh, our, our ancestors did not because they did not inherit the Greek philosophical tradition. They are uh, Semites and primarily poets. And the biblical text is written by Semites and uh, primarily, uh, uh, you know, poetic in its presentation. It's not a rigorous... And that usually trips people up because they impose the uh, Greek philosophical standards onto a text that wasn't written like that. And then, you know, they hold it to those standards, which is ridiculous. And it shows a lack of uh, understanding of texts and how texts are. It shows a, a, a illiteracy. It is a, uh, a pretentious literacy, uh, but it gives way to the, the fact that it is not a literate way to approach uh, any any text. Uh, so how did our ancestors, going back to the fraction, the 15th century um, anaphora of uh, Dioscoros and Epiphanios, there is a, uh, the fraction prayer uh, says, uh, and it gives way, it shows us to how they thought about knowledge. Aite bihera latabab wa aite um, so it's it's wisdom knowledge is personified uh it's a she a she uh, uh, personified in in the feminine and it is where it, it says where is the country of wisdom where is her abode where is her province? Where can the trace of her way be found? Uh, so th th these are epistemological questions, and it's you know it's embedded in our worship, and it actually is signature of the of the biblical text itself, because in the Old Testament wisdom is personified. Also, um, I uh, so, so we we should pause there before like closing the question of what was the epistemological approach of the uh, Ethiopians and consider authors uh, for a second, people. Mm -hmm. Who were the people that were engaged in these questions? In the case of the anaphora, we do not know because the anaphora says it's written by Dioscoros and Epiphanios. 
So that's not going to help us. That's not going to get us anywhere. Uh, but the Andamta names names. It's very, uh, it's still very scant with the Bibli with the bibliography of the masters, the Memharan, who forged it. But still, it has evidence. Here and there, it has evidence. And uh, one of the uh, scholars who is uh, synonymous with the Andamta tradition itself is Memher Esdros. Uh, Memher Esdros uh, was a very renowned teacher. The lived uh, tradition of, of Andamta now, its surviving form, is his revised version. Uh, in around the 1700s, there was uh, it was it was uniform, but there was different. After his revision, there was there was two different styles. The uh, Leibit and the Tachbit. Uh, upper house and lower house. Upper house and lower house. Uh, and Memher S. Duros, he, um, he was, he's remembered as uh, Aratainau S. Duros because he, he, the, the tradition uh, uh, um, remembers him as the four eyed, which, which it's, you know, it, those that, that are engaged in the tradition understand immediately quickly what that means but those outside might be like what does that mean what in the world are they saying um so the the erudite esteros or the four-eyed esteros it, he wasn't named four eyes because he had four glass uh, because he had eyeglasses but he was named four-eyed because he um was master of the four branches of commentary the commentary tradition generally categorizes it, is itself in under four branches, and um, the main, the two main biblical branches are Old Testament commentary and New Testament commentary, which in and of themselves take uh, a very long time to master because the commentary tradition is oral. It's about oral. seven years each. I've heard from Lika Lika on Tabba Malaku told me that when I met him in Canada. So the, they would have memorized verbatim the text of scripture and the commentary. And then the other two branches are uh, the patristic commentaries on the uh, doctrinal, some of the doctrinal tracts of the church fathers of the uh, third, fourth, fifth century. Um, and the other one is the monastic commentary. So he mm -hmm. had learned these four branches of commentary from uh, many different teachers. And Mehmed Esdros appears in the uh, lineage of the, uh, the that the Andamta orally preserves the the lineage of the different uh, masters. He appears in all of the main um, uh, lineages, uh, or they I think they called them uh, um, I forgot what they called them. There's a very there's a particular name, uh, but I, so, I wanted to, to pause here about about that about mm -hmm. those four areas those four eyes that okay. he has one of each the new and the the old i think are pretty obvious for people what's not even obvious to me as someone who's not been a part of that tradition but who's you know who's heard it and been tangential to it is um well let me say the one thing i always point to people out that just always cracks me up and i know you appreciate as a son of marisak is that the uh the fourth tradition that you mentioned the book of the monks Two thirds of it is from the Assyrian Church of the East, and that's just a fact. Like you said, people are going to get well, upset well about the well, the dating. Well, the, the commentary itself is from a lot of it is from the uh, the Turguami Mazmura uh, Dawit. Uh, Turguami Dawit is almost entirely. It is entirely from Theodore of Mopshuesta, which is Church of the East, um, and various sources that have been incorporated into the New Testament commentary are also from uh, the Church of uh, the East. Yeah, and I think people who are more narrowly, um, let me say, anathema-minded <laughs> would be uncomfortable with the level of inclusivity. Yeah, they would, be, uh, <laughs> they would be uncomfortable with the level of inclusivity of the actual tradition because the actual traditional person is inclusive of these doesn't doesn't have an automatic bias against somebody because of what set they're from but examines the evidence of whatever they're saying on a particular the the category. older the, the 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 scholars the of the church of uh, from 
the 19 the, from the 1800s and before were a lot of times very open uh and now uh if they met s- some of uh their their you know uh, uh followers uh, those who have followed in their tradition, if they were able to come and meet each other from time uh, past, they wouldn't recognize each other intellectually because the those that came before were open uh, and they went to great extents to have access to different writings from different places. Uh, some even have been uh, historically recorded as traveling to Rome. There's historical records of, of monks from Debrediwanos going to Rome, uh, but there's also historical records of great scholars like Kufle Georgis being found in Jerusalem, um, uh, in, in Rome, etc. Not just like simple monks, but like uh, great scholars like uh, Memher Kufle Georgis who had learned, uh, you know, so many languages. And, and we know that because of the dictionaries that we have uh that were made by his disciples, uh, which incorporate Arabic, Syriac, Hebrew, um, Greek. You know, these are people that knew many languages. And so, uh, yeah, the, you know, this the, those you see an openness in, in those of, of the past. And you have to wonder how much um, kickback they endured for their, you know, openness in, in this sense. And we do have some historical uh, documents that show us that there was a lot of um, contentions and uh, um, uh, rivalries because you know some were not open and you know e- e- even in the discussion of the capacity of knowledge or the doctrine of knowledge of the scriptural text, uh, you know we haven't even gotten there. I haven't even said what I was going to say yet, and that's you know that's controversial and. Uh, you have to wonder these people said these things in the 16 1700s and it's still now controversial uh it, it, it should always be a scandal the, the last thing i want to ask you before we do get into that because that is the meteor matter that's the meat um the third school you mentioned that has people like saint cyril and saint john chrysostom i know both of those have written extensively for example in the field of biblical commentary so i what i always wondered about that third field is is there like no biblical commentary there is it all doctrinal matters like because it well, the, seems well, the like doctrinal would mean that it's mixed it's mixed yeah. they have tracts on uh commentaries on the scriptural texts they have tracts from their uh letters to so and so or writings against uh, uh, certain ideas. So the, the, the church fathers wrote on various things and the um, the patristic, uh, co- the commentary on patristic writings is uh, functionally a co- commentary on some of the patristic or fathers that p- p- uh, patristic comes from the uh, Latin fa- uh, term for father. And uh, so we just mean, for those who are not familiar, we mean, we, we just mean the early church fathers, um, it's a commentary on some of the things selected, uh, their selected writings, and it just by, happens to be sometimes commentary on scriptural text. So yes, there's this view sometimes, um, common folks, but sometimes common folks can include clergy, uh, have about the sanctity of every jot and tittle of the text that they might have grown up with or that they may have received. Some people uh, poke at the various Amharic translations. Um, I remember at a recent synodal meeting, I had a friend who was a deacon who literally went up there and read from the Bible. And a bishop accused them of being a heretic. And he said, Blessed Father, if you have a different version, please show me your biblical text, and we will mas maskar, we will certify whether I'm a heretic or not. And that bishop actually pulled out his Bible, and he looked at the text, and he had the same text. <laughs> they were looking at the same text. And so 
he had to bow out of the conversation. But the way he said it was, oh, I must have been tricked and gotten the heretics version translation. <laughs> so get into the, the meat of the matter here. Um, do we have a static text or a dynamic text? And talk to us about what type of texts they receive and their approach to receiving these texts. First of all, let me finish telling you about Mehmed Esdros and I, let me make him answer your question. He would have said, and I quote, the text is defective. Imagine saying that in the 1600s. Um, but uh, to play devil's advocate, I think people back then would have been more inclined to understand that nuance than uh, those now because, you know, we come after the uh, printing press. And so, you know, we think that the Bible has, you know, one wording, you know, imagine even you have an English Bible and you think it's just that wording is perfectly um, preserved in all forms, all forms maybe of that publication, but the ancient world writings are based on, you know, manuscript traditions. You have no way to really uh, enforce that. And even, even, even with that being the case, the Bible is almost completely uh, uniform in its ancient uh, um, sources, the, 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 the Greek texts, the, um, the Ethiopic texts, uh, the Syriac, the Hebrew, you know, these ancient, I'm not talking about King James Bible or anything like that. You know, I'm talking about much earlier than that. They're, they're, they're still already uniform, but Esdros uh, in the, in, in the 1600s or so, is, is known to have said that the text is defective and part of the epistemology part part of it is that uh, is the main half that the text is um, th they are not hyper fixated on the letter of the text um, they are not stuck to textual literalism and I think that's what you're asking um, uh, right yeah that's right they, because you're saying and what al nabaram it's not all the same thing because they are accustomed to when you're playing devil's advocate because they're more accustomed to seeing different versions of the same text and it it's it's really hard for people to picture until you see it but when you see it, it it's funny sometimes because there are some verses maybe you have memorized i mean one of the common ways that i see it is uh, in the Ethiopian church nowadays, I've seen like five different versions of Salota Haimanot, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. So that I think mostly people have one version memorized when we say it in the liturgy, but all the little prayer books people have, I've seen like five different versions. So some people, they memorize it from the prayer book rather than from the lit liturgical text. And even the liturgical text is, you know, a frozen version of something else. I've seen different versions of the daily prayers as well. Even the Lord's Prayer, including the Marian part, you know, some people say Lu'ul Ixabhir, some people just say Ixabhir. Um, you know, there are interesting interplays on the word Aram or Im Aram and Maram uh, all over all of these texts of prayers and texts of writing. There are variants. And I think just the concept that there are variants for someone who's new to the study not to someone who's used to it. Someone who's used to it, um, you know, I don't know if you wanted to pause and reflect on the fact that you're reading this text and studying this corpus as a believer. Because I think a lot of people, when they have a naive faith and they begin seeing the variance, it, it's a cause of despondency. It's a cause of them losing faith. But I think that that faith never was founded on rock it was a faith founded in sand in the first place which is why they lost it the, the, this, you this, are, have faith and you're studying these things this takes me back to the epistemology that we brought up in the fraction uh the, fra the fraction of the liturgy is the breaking of the bread it's the prayer that the priest prays as he um uh as he breaks the um the offering and um uh we mentioned that there was a personification right at the foot of, and in that personification is also implicit in the writings of the Old Testament that is revealing the 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 uh, divine being to the people of Israel. And um, at the foot, going to the 
fraction prayer, the Ethiopian liturgy of uh, Dioscoros and Epiphanios, at the foot of it, at the end, the conclusion is that, um, let me uh, read it for you, but wisdom, wisdom is our savior who redeemed us with the sacrifice of his body and bought us with the sprinkling of his blood and chose us for his kingdom forever. They didn't pull this out of nowhere. This is uh, this is biblical theology and wisdom, knowledge. That knowledge is is not on the same uh, platform and the same playing field as wisdom. Wisdom is greater. Knowledge is information. Wisdom is uh, it, it. It goes further than that, and wisdom is personified. So we're not talking about simply knowledge just knowing things that's not it's not necessarily divine but wisdom that is uh transcends all of that includes all of that is personified to the person of uh the um incarnate logos um and this is very important for us to understand because um the biblical text itself uh presents itself as revealing a person, capital P, a divine person, right? Um, it, it, it is not, it does not present itself as, as some perfect utterance that descended upon us from the sky. No, it presents itself as um, literature that reveals to us canonically uh, who the divine person is. And, um, and this is related to knowledge beyond knowledge it transcend a transcendental uh, a, um, a view of knowledge where you know the um, mind of creation is the logos is the divine logos it, that who is a person also and that's that's the means through which uh, the world was created even in Genesis and in the fullness of time the gospel says that he who was in the bosom of the Father came and um, that's a variant reading, a, a beautiful variant. Uh, um, he he came and told us stories of the of the Father, and this is uh, the divine logos, the wisdom, uh, the the mind of the um, creation. Uh, and and you see this in logic, you see it in mathematics, you see it in the um, in the celestial movements, in the uh, in in the process and the lives of plants, animals, etc. What what the church understands is that this is the um, this is the mind and the logic and the or the logos of uh, uh, of God God the Father, and um, so what the gospel says is that it, he is also a person and. Um, Knowledge is not like a devoid. It's not just information, but it, it has in it life and it has in it uh, a person um, who uh, invites him invites our, him himself and us to uh, have a, a community. Uh, the, 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 we, we refer to the old testaments as uh, old covenants or new covenant and old covenant testament is kind of you know it, it's distracting it's a latin word and it's distracting it's it sounds like a um declaration but uh the 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 word is covenant and a covenant is a pact a life pact between two persons and so um this is the second this is the second half of the main epistemology is that the text is is transcended uh it's pointing to a person right imagine uh you and i we we know each other we uh we interact and and we continue to know each other and engage with each other we are two lowercase p persons and if i wrote to you an essay about myself um that essay may contain information about me and direct your mind to me but that text that text is not encapsulate who i am that's what we mean the text uh is trans our view of the text has to transcend the text and this is how the early church viewed scripture also 
Um, so uh, li literally the understanding of uh, the higher form of knowledge, which is wisdom, biblically points us to uh, a, a divine revelation itself. And so the fraction prayer, we see that in the, in the 1500s, the Ethiopian lit liturgists in their fraction prayer, you see this understanding also. And this is the same period, and these are the same people who were writing the biblical commentaries. And you see the same epistemology, text critical, textually transcendent. The text is 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 not the the um, end all be all, and it points you to the Yenita Henok said the customs of God who reveals Himself uh, in His customs to those who um, uh, who seek Him. Uh, Yenita Henok the uh, from uh, Baata the um, Baata Ngondar the uh, w w one of the certifiers of the um, of other memheran um uh so he 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 has said that also and so this is the this is the uh, understanding of if you want to stop me you know this is a good stopping point this is the overall uh uh capacity there's details and nuances to it but this is the um i would summarize it in this way simply uh, in concise manner i would phrase it as a text critical textually transcendent uh tradition yeah it it's beautiful and uh of course i'm gonna stop you whenever you mention my moksha or my name twin there so it's uh that's good uh i'm glad to know other people named Hanok are studying mazaf before me uh so i've heard of him before uh <laughs> yeah yanita Hanok is uh the uh but I heard he knows everything. Uh, he's one of the people, my is teacher, I, I was mostly self-taught, but I learned for six months under one teacher. He mentioned to me that there were a few kind of modern scholars who weren't satisfied with just becoming masters in one field of study. But after they were fully renowned masters, they went and continued their, their pursuit of learning to become masters in other fields as well because why not because some people you know will do the bare minimum to just get a job other people will strive a little bit more but then you know once they're a master in one field they'll stop there but he said there are a few a few people who he wanted me to emulate <laughs> i don't know if i ever will but he gave them to me as exemplars and yanita henok was was one of the people that he had mentioned to me um who continued to learn other fields beyond Aquaquam. But yes, Baata and Gwanda is known as one of the great Aquaquam places, if not the. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. So they, they're they very comfortable with variants because they're able to look beyond the text to the divine person behind the text, the, the metaphysical reality. So they've uh, got two fields of philosophy mentioned here, epistemology and metaphysics, right? So the the reality of the situation and their view of knowledge is there any sort of guide to you know when they decide to quote unquote fix a text like you know you you talked about how memher esteros's version kind of um continues on i've asked this of different people but i wonder what what you would say in this regard um i think in our patristic brotherhood i asked this question so i'll ask you a similar question you know, does Memhur Esdros himself get to make the decision that his text lives on? Um, you know, is there like a synodal decision? Because I think this is another interesting thing. Um, one of the times when we look in the past and we see these few people, sometimes we think it's it's just like a greater past age. What I've come to believe, it's just like a few greats in every generation, and yeah. that, that that's really what it is. It's just and, and, that... and, and 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 that's supported by the uh, e, e, when you look at the figures of Basil the Great, Athanasius, Ephraim the Syrian, etc. They were surrounded by people that didn't think like them for yeah. the most part, other than their disciples. And the uh, there was a great pressure of the general consensus um, that they didn't give into. Yeah, so this the synod on paper, the holy synod, is supposed to be this 
this bastion of the faith, this place from which everything sprouts. But in practice, when I, especially when I've studied the Ethiopian church, it seems like almost nothing is a synodal decision. I mean, from the 20th century, like mid 20th century till now, we start seeing synodal decisions. And it looks like going forward, that's what it's going to be. But when we examine the history, uh, it doesn't seem like the Holy Synod gathers. Uh, and even if it, even if it did, it would get challenged. Even if it did, it would get challenged by these people because these people were challenged and they did challenge others. Yeah, so, but, so it's what, irrelevant. What I understand from what you're saying is basically it seems like Mamher Esdoros is growing up in this tradition. He continues the tradition. And the reason that his stuff lasts is just because of, you know, how bright, intelligent he was and, and how how prolific he was. Prolific. It, it lasted. The, the, un, the His version of the revised Andamta tradition survives because it was palpable to the students. The Leibets ceased to exist uh, primarily because of external factors. Um, the last few teachers were killed in the 1800s by uh, invading um, uh, uh, dervishes uh, in Gondar city. Um, uh, but the Tachvet, you know, it had expanded uh, far beyond the the the, the Leibet, Esteros's version, because it was it was palpable. But you know, you have to understand that it's an oral tradition; it has to be memorized. The mm -hmm. Amharic is poetic; uh, it's easy to, easier to memorize. Um, uh, is it, the, it's shorter. It, it's concise. I wouldn't say short. I would say it's concise. It's poetic. Um, and the his text is revised, the text of scripture itself. By the way, the, the, the scripture in the scriptural text in the Andamta, biblical uh, uh, commentary uh, corpuses of Old Testament, New Testament is revised. It's a very uh, much cleaner uh, edited biblical text. And it edited sometimes we'll see, I'm going to uh, give you one example that I, that I presented in my article. Um, Sometimes it points to much ancient versions that are not even in existence in 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 Giz, uh, biblical manuscripts, and so um, they had the the by the way the Leibniz tradition recognized that the, that the biblical text was also problematic. Es as a uh, is quoted, which he he would I presume from his name he was the father of confession to one of the emperors, one of the Gondorian emperors. Um, he's noted as saying that um, uh, you interpret the texts as they're presented because um, due to various um, scribal errors, anything written in Giz is not known for certain. You see what I'm saying? So he, he's like, you have to take the this text with a grain of salt, but you have to interpret it as it is. And But the Leibet scholars, they did not edit the text. But they're even known to have acknowledged that, you know, they're te they're, even they were textually, you know, critical in theory, but not in practice. Mehmet Estros and the Tachvet tradition is definitely text critical in, in practice, which I'll show you an example from the literature. So far, we've only talked about... Um, peoples and and ideas and and the the you know the third uh uh and final evidence is always you know the the literature uh and uh but um is is that clear good to know i saw you good to know is she um that's how you uh i'm gonna present um can you see it? Itayalao. Itayal, okay. So this is uh, from the Andimta. Uh, this is the text of go the Gospel of John 14, verse 16. And I will pray the Father that he may send you the paraclete, another helper, who will be with you unto the ages. So in the Andamta, they collect, uh, th there's a mechanism called uh, Avinet, Yilal, Yilal Avinet, 
And so here in the commentary, it says, Zakamaya yamil abinet yigingal. So the yilal abinet is a mechanism uh, that they use to, crit, to, crit, to critique the text. So they'll look at the letter of the text and they'll say, um, Yilal Abinet is always saying, look, there is an ancient manuscript that reads so and so, is always what Yilal Abinet says. And here for this reading, it says, Zakamaya Yamil Abinet Yigingal. Um, Zakamaya means another like me. And uh, the Greek uh, uh, here, Alon Parakliton, um, where uh, Parakliton is the paraclete. Alos is um, uh, another of the same kind. Eteros is another of a different kind. But these Greek, th this Greek uh, uh, reading is uh, not present. We always are, are finding kala uh, in, in the Ge'ez versions of John. And we have um, established uh, uh, readings from different manuscripts of John in Ge'ez from, I would say, the uh from the year from around the year 300 to the 1800s and this reading is not present in his versions um so uh you know they, they are looking at the text and um and there are other text critical uh terminologies that the andamta commentary uses but they're using this particularly to point to an ancient text. When we consider the sources that this reading, that the Andamta scholars could have found this reading from, you have to understand they were familiar with the, the, the whole literature of the Ethiopian church at that time, because you don't just become, you don't just go to Maz'af Beit, you know, you spend a lot of time, um, and especially by the point that you become a master, you would have gone through the Kene um, schools, uh, or the poetry schools and it is almost certain that the by the way that the commentary tradition was born out of the uh uh um NA tradition or the poetry tradition and so these people you know were extremely familiar you can and you can tell how familiar they were with the literature because they quote it uh uh very easily and actually in the andamta there is no reference to quotes it's just literally it assumes you know what it's quoting and it'll quote it in giz and it may be quoting you know <laughs> it may be quoting the liturgy it may be quoting hagiographies or gadlat it may be quote you, you don't know what it's quoting but it assumes you know because you know this was a lifestyle uh and so uh the source for this reading particularly is absent in the haimanot abo which is a uh, 15th century florilegium, and it's it, Hanata was translated from Arabic. Therefore, um, you know, it's not surprising that we don't find this reading there. It's not in the Gibra Hamamat. You would think that it, you you might find it there, because those are important sources for patristic tracts. Uh, the Haimanata Abo Gibra Hamamat. There are other um, in the research. There are other sources that I point to that could be possible. Uh, um, uh, influences for this reading, uh, and one of them is Masafahawi. Uh, I wasn't able to conclusively rule it out, but um, I did examine it, and um, but through all, all in all, I was able to identify that this was referencing John Chrysostom's uh, third century, uh, fourth century text. Um, where Chrysostom clarifies that another uh, shows the difference of person, and and Paraclete shows the connection of substance. Uh, so he, you know, he's saying that, uh, and the text is saying that the helper is um, a uh, another person like me is what he's saying. And so, um, uh, this is one of the mechanisms that. Uh, and it's not the only one. It's one of the mechanisms with through which they um, cur sometimes, you know, redirect you to a better reading. And in my uh, thesis, uh, which I'm uh, soon to be published uh, as a book, I actually show in a certain place where they correct the letter of the biblical text using the, the commentary. So the commentary are, uh, ascends into the commentary you can understand as being uh, beneath the scripture, 
the reading because it comes after. And it, as if, if you imagine the literary blocks as uh, uh, one being under the other, uh, the commentary ascends and corrects the text of the uh, of, of the Bible uh, in a particular reading. Uh, and I show this in another um, in an, in another work that's uh, soon to come. Even that that's wonderful. I hope people have gotten a, a good taste of this. And if they want to check this out, they just need to sit tight right now and we'll drop a link on them eventually. Or is there is there any, where where should we point people in the interim? Because now that you've given them a gursha, they are going to want more. Met a few a few months. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking two months. It should should be out. That's good. Is there anything else that we didn't cover um, that you'd like to say about the andimta or the and one corpus? Um, bzu bal nagar al al and you know we don't have enough time uh, mm -hmm. here and today. You know we chose a particular. Uh, topic to discuss, but um, it is, you know, imperative for uh, us to take seriously, uh, oftentimes, the uh, scholarly tradition of the church and not the opinions necessarily of those who have, um, who those, those who pretend to uh, represent it. Uh, if, if people understand what we said, a lot of people have a problem with it <laughs> because this is not how the uh, scripture as it, it, just like in the story that you told about the bishop and the, and the deacon uh, earlier on, it's not how people view the Bible. And, um, and Mehmet Esteros opposes them. The Andimta, the surviving Andimta tradition opposes them. It opposes that view. Not only that, St. Ephraim the Syrian opposes them. Gregory of Nyssa opposes them. So why are you in opposition to the church uh, doctrine? You should be um, on on board with it. And so I think um, we do well to, to pay attention and to take seriously what this means uh, for how we uh, read the Bible and not just those of the Ethiopian church, but those uh, anyone that is seriously, seriously engages with, with the text. Thank you so much. And may the blessings of the prayers of all of the fathers and forerunners in our tradition, both narrowly and broadly, who have worked in this field of biblical studies or scriptural analysis, may the blessing of the prayers be with you and me and with the entire audience as well. Amen.